Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta and today's topic of discussion is the politicization of India's armed forces. Once upon a time, we in India used to consider it a matter of pride that our military, our defense services, our armed forces were far less politicized. They were far more insulated from the political leadership even as they acknowledge the leadership of the civilian political leaders. Why has this come to pass? Why has psychophancy become rampant in the armed forces? And then why are so many senior officers increasingly identifying themselves with the Hindu nationalism of the Bharatiya Janata Party that unashamedly, unabashedly seeks to exploit military achievements for political gain. I'm very happy to welcome Rahul Bedi from Chandigarh. Rahul Bedi has been a senior journalist for over 40 years. He specialized in writing on military matters and the defense services. Thank you so much, Rahul, for giving me your time. And I was reading the article that you recently wrote for The Wire. And what you mentioned is that we are having this huge debate today in the main media, in the, in the mainstream media, as well as the social media, about how there has been this the nexus between the military and the political leadership that has become stronger, and that what, to use your words, guarantees reciprocal benefit. Please elaborate on what you mean. Well, it's a complicated situation because, uh, you know, I think we first have to go back in history uh, to 1947 and the experience of Pakistan and uh, to for some years in Bangladesh. Um, let me at the onset state that we are nowhere close to where Pakistan is as far as the military ascendancy is concerned. But what has happened over the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years, and particularly over the last five or six years, is that the military and the political class have used each other for mutual profit. The military class has used the pol politician to climb up the promotion uh, pyramid, which is a very narrow pyramid and uh, is a very greasy pyramid and a very slope up the pyramid. And the politician has used the military uh, to tom tom national security and not only that but more dangerously to tailor uh, operational um, responsibilities of the military to suit political ends so it's a in a sense a symbiotic relationship between the two and both profit from it but i think the loser in this case is the country rahul you know what you mentioned is that very often, what is happening today in the military is justified. And I'm here referring to your article, and you say that, you know, there have been so many instances of military personnel charged with corruption, illegally off offloading subsidized canteen goods, especially liquor, uh, you know, being sold in the black market. But what you've been particularly critical about is senior military officers lobbying, lobbying with politicians. And you've used very, very strong language. But at one level, <coughs> you've also put forth the argument that this, if this is true for Indian society as a whole, if corruption is rampant, if this kind of psychopathy is rampant, then how can you expect the army, the navy, the Air Force to be, you know, insulated or divorced from what's happening around all over in our society. Well, you know, this is a double-edged argument, uh, which is used uh, at times by the military to say that since the military also comes from Indian society, can it be any different? But the other side of the argument is that the military sets different standards for itself. It believes it is a lot superior. The uh, justice system in the military is swift. Discipline is greater. And therefore, it, it's more ethical and it comes from a different sort of uh, background and ethos. 
Now, uh, you can't really have both those arguments at the same time. Either the military is superior and therefore it should behave better, or it's part of the same venal, corrupt, uh, nepotistic uh, civilian setup uh, and behaves that way. But it can't be a combination of both. And the military really tries to fall between two stools because it's, uh, it's hypocritical when it wants and it's, um, it takes a higher moral ground when it wants. So it really, I would accuse the military of uh, very severe double standards. Rahul, you know, you talk about how the military no longer holds that high moral ground that it used to hold. Once upon a time, when, when, you know, all the way, you say all the way through till the late 80s, military officers were held in high esteem by society. They were upright people. They were respected, as you say, eagerly sought after by parents as suitable matches for their daughters. And even the fancy perks, the, the, the colonial era uh, 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 perquisites that they get was kind of said, okay, we, we tolerate that because after all, you're fighting for our country. And so what if once in a while you go for horse riding and shikar and, and mountaineering and golf, etc., etc., etc. But over the years, and you are really seeing this, there's been a deterioration. That the very politician that once upon a time, the military officers, and I'm using, I quote you, Soldiers, generations of soldiers had vilified politicians for duplicity, ineptitude, and for completely misreading military matters, has today emerged as his patron and is being manipulated cynically for political ends. That's very strong language you're using. Would you like to explain and elaborate and maybe even put up, uh, give us a few examples? Well, I think examples are a little difficult because that would entail naming people and I don't really intend to do that because uh, it's firstly libelous and secondly, I think there's no uh, counter defense on the other side. But actually, there's a historical reason for this because uh, military service was one of the few avenues of advancement in colonial India. And a lot of people uh, in those days uh, did join the military and did extremely well, and they carried on the traditions uh, uh, after independence. And uh, they were, they, life was generally a lot more, uh, I would say, a lot more honest, a lot more decent. And uh, there, was, um, uh, there was decency in society, and the army, in fact, represented that. And I think the army conducted itself extremely well in, uh, in, in all the wars that it fought in 1947, in 1962, in 65, in 71. Um, and, um, and it was held in high regard. And the, uh, there was, it was a political uh, army. I mean, even in messes, I remember as a young boy, uh, I had uh, friends uh, of, uh, who were, uh, whose parents were in the army. And there was, you know, politics was never really discussed in the mess. Uh, it was sort of a Freemasonry of soldiery, as it were. Um, so, but unfortunately, all that changed over the years because uh, um, there was profit to be had, there were promotions to be had, there was money to be made, and the politicians uh, realized that the soldiers were uh, exploitable, and therefore it exploited them. And I think this really reached uh, a crescendo during the Kargil War when um, the uh, National uh, Democratic Alliance headed by Prime Minister Vajpayee was in office. I mean, the Kargil War was unabashedly used by the BJP-led government to push its own agenda and to return to power soon after the Kargil War was over because a lot of people tend to forget that during the Kargil War, uh, the NDA government was a caretaker government. Um, so, uh, and that trend has continued uh, in the last uh, five or six years under Prime Minister Modi. Uh, for example, he had the so-called surgical strikes uh, across the Pakistani border in 2016. And then we just had the, the Uttar Pradesh, just before the Uttar Pradesh elections. And, and the Uttar Pradesh elections and stood, stood the BJP in extremely good stead. I mean, everybody expected the BJP to lose because it had come soon after demonetization, uh, but the BJP won. 
and in fact all the posters at that time during the elections uh, featured uh, the military uh, subsequently there was the air strike in balakot last year uh, and we all know the outcome of the general elections uh, mr modi won uh, over 300 seats uh, so they, and as a consequence a lot of people who were around in those days who were in uh, senior military positions have uh, also profited in terms of getting uh, jobs after retirement uh, so you and, uh, i, I think you, know, you don't uh, it's hardly a secret that general vk singh is is a union minister he he, he i mean so that's uh, everybody knows about him where we didn't have uh, yes, that, I, mean, uh, i think one thing uh, we must uh, um, say about general vk singh i mean here was a general who went and uh, i think disgraced himself by going to court over a alleged wrongly uh, attributed date of birth and even if he had prevailed he would have served for another 4 or 5 months uh, but he brought the office of the army chief uh, down by several pegs by following that route and then subsequently went into politics and is uh, currently a minister so mm -hmm. i think uh, the profile uh, and dignity of the army has been uh, significantly sullied over the last uh, 15 20 years uh, rahul uh, i am going to come back to you on some of the points that you made but before that let me step a little back you yourself talked about how the indian army and the armed forces did incredibly well not just in 47 but in 71 but the 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 sort of uh, the 62 was the war with china was was terrible now once again the military blamed the political leadership for long decisions and you have argued in your article i was reading that it's about time that we released a report that was presented way back in 1963 the hender henderson brooks inquiry report and and uh, you know i mean uh, everybody is wondering why 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 is it that that after so many years we haven't released that report and you point out there are just two copies of that report i mean what is it so sensitive about that report that it should be still kept under wraps actually i i i mean that's a million dollar question nobody really has an answer to it and a lot of uh, what was in the report in fact uh, has been uh, has been published in a book called india's china war by a uh, former foreign correspondent called neville maxwell of the london times but again it's not authenticated because the report has not been released <coughs> i think over the last 30 or 40 years there have been two or three official commissions uh, which have examined the feasibility of releasing the henderson brooks report but have all for some strange reason um, decided against it and the reasoning that is uh, that is relevant uh, to these uh, committee reports is that it is operationally sensitive now i i really don't know what that means because what happened in 1962 is of very little if any relevance in 2020 uh, which is you know almost 60 70 years ago uh, so it, it it really is mystifying why the henderson brooks report is still uh, still not been released and uh, i would be very very i'm sure there would be millions of scholars who would be very interested in reading the henderson brooks report and uh, i am given to understand that one reason why it's not been released is that it vilifies the politicians and blame the politicians more than it does the soldiery okay so but that again is speculation all right it's interesting you know in your article you've gone back to uh, and uh, uh, as, as a story which a lot of people have heard about you know about a uh, general who became uh, field marshal sam manikshra who headed the indian army between 1969 and early 1963 and this pertains to the timing of moving into what is today bangladesh what was then east pakistan and he actually uh told the then prime minister indira gandhi that no i don't want to do it now wait for winter and that's how uh this entire uh, uh 
um, the Indian Army and the Indian Armed Forces moved into Bangladesh, and then Bangladesh came into being only in December 1971. So, so uh, uh, I suppose what you are suggesting is that the the military leadership had the guts to tell the political leadership straight on their face what they felt, and and you believe that this kind of independence, this kind of autonomy, this kind of spine is lacking among the present generation of leaders of the armed forces. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And but I mean, I think to be fair, we must also give credit to the political leadership of the time. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, 1970, uh, early 71, uh, when Mrs. Gandhi asked Manak Shaw to move in and Manak Shaw basically told her, he said, the monsoons are coming up. And he says, I can't ensure um, uh, uh, that my troops will be able to survive. And also he said, uh, we don't know about the Chinese. And uh, he, he told Mrs. Gandhi very firmly, uh, and according to people uh, who were at that meeting, and there have been several accounts, uh, people were a little taken aback because Mrs. Gandhi, again, was a very autocratic leader. Um, but she, she realized the wisdom of what Manik Shah was saying, and she agreed. Unfortunately, that quality of officer is uh, missing now. Um, most of the people who are uh, in top positions of uh, authority at military headquarters and in the higher command are of, uh, to put it very bluntly, poor caliber and have got there purely through um, their obsequious behavior and through, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, reasonably unfair means. Uh, and um, no dissidence uh, is tolerated, no differences of opinion are encouraged, uh, and it's basically a yes-man army. And uh, once you have a yes-man army, then uh, you're going to have a yes-man leadership. And when you have a yes-man leadership, it's going to be subservient to the political leadership. So therefore, there's going to be very little difference between the military and the politician. So that's the stage where we are at, and uh, you I don't know, think uh, you I have think the genies are the problem. <laughs> Rahul, Admiral Arun Prakash has declared, and he said that we all know that age, rank, and financial status demand much more deference in India than anywhere in the world. And he's been very critical of what he, uh, the culture of obsequiousness, of servility, of plain, simple chumchagiri in the armed forces and 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 uh, admiral arun prakash has acknowledged that there were very very fine officers uh, who did not get promoted why because they did not want to conform they they were not i mean and 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 they put forth their views in a forthright manner in a blunt manner and and any any and and he actually goes on to say that the evil of psychophancy will undermine the roots of india's military Unless, and you say he states wishfully, that the senior leadership curbs it ruthlessly. Your views? I think uh, Admiral Prakash, who I know well and respect, um, uh, is, uh, is whistling up uh, a gum tree. Uh, I don't think, uh, and he, I think the fantasy that he's, uh, he's perpetuating is not going to happen. And the only certainty is that it's going to get worse because the human resource... Uh, that is going into politics as well as the military is of a very poor quality. Uh, there is very little uprightness left. And the only thing that matters is success and money. Uh, so I don't think uh, the, the, uh, the dissidents or the any kind of uh, um, good quality officers are going to make it beyond the rank of colonel or maximum a brigadier in the army. And the equivalent in, of course, the Navy and the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have uh, 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 made another point in your article, and, and you said that there was a bargain. And, and uh, there was a creation of the post of the Chief of Defense Staff, the CDS. But you say the military remains utterly clueless about the tasks, the responsibilities of the Chief of Defense Staff. Would you like to elaborate and add to what you have written? You know, the, um, the military has been saying that uh, there's, a, there's a one point formula, a magic bullet that they have, 
which is called the CDS. And if the CDS comes in, everything is going to work, uh, work, work very efficiently. And they've been demanding it for the last, uh, in fact, 25, 30 years. Uh, a lot of the political leadership has been very wary of uh, creating the post of chief of defense staff because they, they look at Pakistan and, of course, they look at Bangladesh and they look at other countries in this region. Um, but uh, anyway, the recommendations of the Cargill Review Committee in 2001, 2002 uh, were responsible for the creation, for wanting the creation of a CDS, who eventually came about, and General Rawat, who was the army chief, became the first, uh, India's first chief of defense staff. But despite having lobbied for it, despite having agitated for it for the last 20 years, the military has spent no time in trying to figure out a priority or an agenda or a program or a timetable for the chief of defense staff. And even the notification that came out early this year in January, uh, appointing General Rawat as the chief of defense staff, sorry, it came out in December of last year. Um, because he took over on the, I think, in the 1st of January, um, doesn't really outline what his responsibilities are likely to be. So again, it's just yet another sort of jobs for the boys. And uh, operationally, the CDS is not responsible for uh, the Army, Navy or Air Force. But it seems that General Rawat, having been Army Chief, is exercising uh, some amount of operational responsibility in the army overriding the current army chief. So, you know, there is a, there is a problem, there is a clash. Um, so it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit difficult and it's a bit tenuous as to how this is likely to be worked out. And I think uh, the next uh, few years and particularly the next few months, given the crisis we're facing on the Ladakh border in, uh, with China, is, uh, works itself out. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Ladakh. I mean, that's been occupying everybody's mind and, and people are complaining that we don't know, we don't have enough information. The line of actual control was always never clearly demarcated. Uh, we know there have been uh, uh, 20 casualties on our side, including Commanding Officer Babu. We don't know what has happened on their side. There are all kinds of claims and counterclaims, including the claim that Chinese, the Chinese have encroached into uh, a territory which we thought uh, belonged to us. But I come back to the point with which I started. The, militis, the, the politicization of India's armed forces, the politicization of India's military. You write that there's been a Faustian bargain between the soldier and the politician. And increasingly, the top military personnel are identifying themselves with this jingoistic, ultra-nationalist, this Hindu, Hindutva line that seeks to achieve, you know, seeks to uh, exploit whatever military achievements that have taken place for political gain. Now, we, we've talked about what happened, the, the surgical strike and then the uh, outcome of the assembly elections in Uttar Pradesh. We've talked about uh, Balakot, Pulwama, uh, February 2009 and the Lok Sabha elections. But sometimes these things take you by surprise. I mean, see what happened in Ladakh. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said, made a statement, and then later, when people asked him about it, you know, uh, that statement, I mean, there were all kinds of clarifications issued. So I'm saying, post Ladakh, do you think Mr. Narendra Modi's government will continue to be successful in using the armed forces, and I dare say, with the complicity of some of the top individuals in the armed forces, and uh, to reap more political gains in the near future? Most definitely, most definitely. I think if you, for this, uh, again, uh, in this, there's no straight answer, but I think uh, we, uh, if we go back to the Kargil war, um, after the Kargil war ended, Prime Minister Vajpayee, to his credit, ordered an inquiry into the Kargil war within three days of the Kargil war coming to an end. Uh, we know, know fairly, um, uh, fairly uh, firmly that uh, the Chinese, Chinese intrusion into Indian territory was also due to an intelligence failure. Uh, the army was, um, army was deployed there, so the army is in a sense culpable. Um, but uh, I think the army and the politician are, uh, are working in tandem with each other to uh, sustain a sort of a workable solution 
um, which I think uh, they will present to us. And therefore, this partnership between the army and the politician, or not the army so much as the military and the politician, uh, will, um, will proliferate and will continue and will grow. And I think it's a very, very dangerous thing because the army has to stand up to the politician at some point. And I think the politician also has to, uh, has to um, uh, make the uh, army a lot more accountable than it has. So I think uh, uh, there are a lot of ifs and buts. And like uh, Admiral Prakash says, the higher political leadership will have to take action. But unfortunately, I don't think the higher political leadership in this case is either going to take action or is capable of taking action or even, which is even more disturbing, wants to take any action. Well, thank you so much, Rahul Bedi, for sharing your views candidly and explaining to the viewers of NewsClick how the Indian military, the Indian armed forces, the defense services have been increasingly politicized under the Narendra Modi government. Thank you once again and keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.